I like to look at children as kind of living Zen masters in a way, parachuted into our lives and guaranteed to push every single button that we have. The important thing that a parent can give a child is his or her presence, to actually be present for the child. People under the misapprehension that say, if I'm a mindful parent, uh, there won't ever be any yelling in the family, for instance, or that the family will always be a nice, calm, meditative, enlightened family. Nonsense. It's got nothing to do with that. It has to do with embracing the full catastrophe of life, the human condition. If you span the horizon of life, certainly one of the places where we experience huge challenges and also um, receive tremendous joy uh, is in family life, and uh, in particular in, in parenting, but in all of the relationships in family. And uh, it's a wonderful environment in which to actually cultivate awareness, the same kind of wakefulness that uh, we teach people in the stress reduction clinic and that they often carry off into their lives, both at work and at home. But to actually make the practice of mindfulness or, or to actually bring the practice of mindfulness into the family is a huge discipline of its own and one that I think is incredibly worthy and valuable both for the parents doing it and for the, the benefit of the children. When you do this certain kind of inner work on yourself that is based on moment-to-moment non-judgmental awareness, you wind up seeing a whole range of different kinds of ways of embracing a child, even in very difficult or stressful situations, that could push your buttons hugely and work in ways that honor their sovereignty, that are based on empathy and compassion and acceptance of who they are, but at the same time are protective of them, are nurturing of them, are appropriately uh, limit-setting with them, and also appropriately uh, loving and nurturing of their freedom and creativity. That's one hell of a job. And where do you learn about that stuff? I mean, it's something that you virtually have to make up as you go along. And as soon as you've figured out something, the kids change. Some people say that having children makes you human. I actually don't go so much for those kinds of encapsulations. I think we're all human regardless of the situation that we're in. But uh, what people mean by that kind of thing is that you actually don't get to discover all of who you are sometimes as a person until you have children. Uh, if you wind up having children, or at least looking backwards, it feels that way, like, my God, uh, I had no idea there were this many dimensions to life. There were that many ways in which I could suffer, in which I could feel anxious, in which I could be worried about somebody else and how their trajectory in life was going to unfold. When I first had Nina, it became clear to me that uh, my desires to be successful, powerful, <laughs> and famous <laughs> were um, as nothing compared to my desires to, to be with the girls when they were young and to spend a lot of time with them. And I was very fortunate to be able to do that. So there's nothing like having children to actually stretch the envelope of your being uh, to limits that you probably didn't even realize you had. And that's one of the ways in which I think mindful parenting is on its, in its own right a profound spiritual discipline, where by spiritual discipline I mean a yoga or a meditation in its own right, a way to actually do a certain kind of inner work that will inform you 
about the sort of levels and depths and dimensions of your own being that very often are so opaque we might not visit them. What were your original ideas about parenting? Do you remember and how have they changed over time? When we got together and it looked serious, I wanted him to know two things. One, I was going to keep my maiden name. I was never going to give that up again because mm -hmm. this is my second marriage. And two, that I wanted to have at least one child. So three children later. We can't count. <laughs> Luckily. <clears throat> Absolutely. And I, I, I wanted to uh, have children because um, it, it was part of, uh, for, it was fulfill, uh, fulfillment for me. And I wanted to be able to raise decent human beings that would have a positive impact on the people around them. Well, I really wanted a daughter first because mm -hmm. Joel already had a son. And then I wanted, you know, I was hoping that the second one would be a boy, and he was, and I was thrilled with that. And then we had a five and a half year gap and decided to have Jorian. And we were very excited about having another daughter. For me, it's important that the family have a, a strong sense of communication because my parents were separated and divorced. So I've always had this sort of mission that <laughs> I want to prove in a way because of my experience that two people can live together um, happily and healthily in terms of communication. pregnant with Georgia, I didn't think I would have the capacity to love another child the same way that I love Nina. Uh -huh. And as soon as she was born, she taught me <laughs> that um, when my mother said it, said it so beautifully, each child brings their own love into the world. And so she taught me uh, the, 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 the capacity that I had to love. As with everything else, the family can be an environment of tremendous mindlessness that we just kind of barge along through doing what we can and being sort of periodically conscious or aware and then a lot of the time very reactive, very much on autopilot. And also it's a huge environment for emotional hijacking because uh, we get caught up in our feelings about how things should be in the family and when they're not going the way we want. Often, you know, we are much more effective communicators in our work worlds than we are in the family. And uh, so we let ourselves be seen in the family sometimes in ways that we would never allow ourselves to be seen at work. And we might treat our children in ways that we would never treat a colleague or a coworker. This, of course, doesn't escape the children. So there's always a price for the kind of unconscious, disrespectful, uh, short-tempered, self-righteous orientations that we all inevitably fall into. But what a wonderful field it is to uh, bring awareness to and see if we can't in some way grow out of working our own rough edges as uh, our children grow along with us. So there's a maturity level that I bring to parenting now that I didn't have before. And a lot of it has to do with just living that long and having situations occur that I had to deal with, uh, conflicts I had to resolve. It's putting more effort into what's occurring on a daily basis in my life. Mm -hmm. How the tone of voice I use, the, um, the, the thoughtful way in which I consider the events of the day and the, the, the the pains that my children are going through on a daily basis. of ups and downs because I had this vision of, oh, you know, the, the, the 
breastfeed the baby, put them down, they go to sleep, and you could, I, for the first time in my life, I could go make muffins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it didn't work out that happen. way at all. <laughs> Nina screamed blue murder all day long. <laughs> so she went to be held all the time? <laughs> all the time. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was my first rude awakening, that you can have all the ideas and expectations about parenting that you want, but your teachers are going to be your children. I like to look at children as kind of live-in Zen masters in a way, parachuted into our lives and guaranteed to push every single button that we have, places where we're attached to things being a certain way, where we uh, want a particular outcome, where we haven't even considered other possibilities, and of course the creativity of children is infinite, so they will come up with things that we never would have even conceived of, and many of which we might feel like, no room for this in my family, and, and sort of seize up a little bit. Uh, seizing up is usually not a very good way to nurture either the children or our relationships with them. And that's not to say that uh, mindful parenting is all about being uh, absurdly permissive or utterly permissive or not caring about what the choices are that our children make or what their behaviors are or the risks that they take in their lives. It's not that at all. It's really about being conscious and respecting their integrity. There's a lot of research that suggests that uh, the sense of well-being of a child psychologically uh, is really uh, formulated in the early years through the interaction with the parents. So uh, making eye contact with the children when they're babies, a lot of holding, a lot of physical contact, a lot of touch, which is tremendously healing. You seem so comfortable with her, both of you. Yeah. Now I think it's easier, because at the beginning we didn't know exactly what it was that she needed or wanted, so now we feel more comfortable because we're able to understand what it is mm -hmm. that she... So she you're needs. attuning to each other, yeah. To, yeah. to her needs. Yeah. Yeah, I could feel that in the way, you know, did you notice when she was nursing that she was doing, doing that, that movement yeah. with Anne, she was looking for Brad. you and holding on to you yeah. and... and uh, that you were gazing at her and yeah. just there with, in a special, very such a special moment. Yeah, it is. It's nice. Yeah. And, and you have her right there in your bed, so. Yeah. She's there with in you the virtually morning, all the time, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the best moment because she's so cuddly and and she's just so happy to. As soon as, soon as she sees either of our faces, she smiles. Mm -hmm. and, she knows we're there. It's mm -hmm. nice. Sometimes you can actually hear yourself thinking or even saying out loud, I can't believe this family. I mean, this isn't a family. This is so crazy. I mean, no family is this crazy. Uh, I don't know how I got into this family. I cannot believe this is happening. And often you say it of yourself, like I can't believe I'm doing this and I don't know how to stop it either. Nina often thinks I'm angry when I'm sad or nervous or frightened. Mm -hmm. We went through a, an incident where I got angry at the girls and they got out of the car and Nina took off in the dark, winter dark, from where we were, quite a ways from the subway, in, in sort of, not what I would call a walking area of Toronto, with Georgia, and went home. I just followed because I thought, <laughs> I thought there it was, was the best of, thing to do. There was a lot of confusion. Rest assured that part of the assignment of families is craziness you know that if you're going to be in a family there's craziness it's whether sometimes it's hidden sometimes it's sort of n n locked in the cellar so that we can't talk about the craziness of the family then it really comes out big time around all the corners and in the shadows and so forth uh, there is a there are moments when things just seem to fray and go 
uh, off the deep end, uh, you know, in families, that somebody or other is going to lose it. You know what? It's perfectly human. There's nothing wrong with it. People uh, uh, under the misapprehension that say, if I'm a mindful parent, uh, there won't ever be any yelling in the family, for instance, or that the family will always be a nice, calm, meditative, enlightened family. Nonsense. It's got nothing to do with that. It has to do with embracing the full catastrophe of life, the human condition of like, somebody wants this, somebody wants that. If you have three kids and they all want something different at the same time and you're home alone as the parent, lots of luck because there ain't no way to really do it right. Sometimes it's a matter of just kind of juggling and you become the best juggler that you can and you blow it here and you blow it there and you drop this ball and you drop that ball. And it's not saying that, oh, your children are going to suffer. Look, you drop the ball here or you drop the ball there. There's nothing like that. Really what they're learning from most is how you handle your life, how you live your life, how you embody being. And our children learn far more from how we be than anything that we say or tell them, our great wisdom about life and how they should live or what they have to watch out for. What they're watching is how are we handling life? How are we handling our stress? How are we handling our disappointments? How do we handle our grief? How uh, in touch are we with um, the present moment? I told Nina I shouldn't have gotten that angry. You know, that I, I was at fault there. I can tell it's whether I go to bed with a lump in my throat, as you might say, if we've had an argument or something like that uh, the, the, in the evening. But in general, we, um, we try to clear any uh, concerns up before we go to sleep. We try not to take them to bed with us. So our children learn what's called emotional competencies or emotional intelligence from the the kind of feeling tone of the f of family life, of the home. So if the home is always in insanely chaotic and emotionally reactive, the children, guess what, are going to be a little bit on the emotionally reactive side. They won't be learning that you can go from anger to uh, stillness or calmness, that it's perfectly fine to be angry, that there are many, many different ways to deal with anger. But if anger always leads to brutality, if anger always leads to a certain kind of utilization of force, if it always leads to uh, mm, violence of a certain kind and disrespect, then the children are living in that kind of environment. They're either going to have to hide out and get into sort of emotional foxholes uh, and disappear sometimes for 10 or 20 years and then like have a, not such an easy time figuring out who they are. Or uh, the parents can actually say things like, hey, listen, I'm sorry for what I said back then 10 minutes ago. The irony is, of course, that we are sometimes hardest on the people that we love the most. We sometimes are most shaming, most humiliating, most disregarding of the people who, if you were asked, you would say, I love these children infinitely. But sometimes we don't actually know how to operationalize that. And love is often more expressed in how present you are at the breakfast table, or whether you make eye contact when you're saying goodbye in the morning, or whether you... Uh, smile or ask them about their homework in a way that sounds like you're really interested and you're not just like, how was school today? Uh, those little moments wind up weaving together a life. They weave together a whole life. Uh, if you are completely out of the moment and on automatic pilot, then it becomes kind of two-dimensional. It collapses and 10 or 20 years can go by and you can really wonder like, you know, what happened in my relationship with my children? What happened was uh, someone wasn't, someone was asleep at the wheel. Someone wasn't paying attention. Someone didn't have any time. Someone was claiming, I'm too busy for this. You take care of them. Uh, and eschewing a certain kind of responsibility. We could have all the best excuses and the best reasons in the world. But if we ask ourselves what's really important in life, I think most parents will say, when all push comes to shove, they're not going to say, on their deathbed, I wish I'd spent more time at the office. That's the cliche. Nobody goes to their deathbed saying, God, I wish I'd spent more time at the office. But a lot of people go to their graves saying, 
I did it all wrong with my children. I didn't actually make myself emotionally available to them because I was lost in my own ideas and opinions of how things should be. I don't have a vision of my mother physically being in our home mm. because I don't think she was ever there. And so I was made, put in charge and had the key to the door when I was eight. And um, <clears throat> we were pretty well told to be independent and we were, and I sort of kept the other two in check. She was very loving, and she was strict when she was around, so there were definite rules. She was very big on politeness and courtesy, and, and we were a strong family unit, and we knew that, and we felt that. Um, the fact that she wasn't physically around much, um, I think, was okay for me, not so okay for my brother, and I don't think it was okay for my younger sister either. Um, <clears throat> but it makes me want to be around for my children. So I chose, after I had the first child, to work part-time and to change my career to accommodate the children so that I would be around. It's a very, very wonderful practice to actually bring awareness to our relationship with our own parents. Uh, there may be tremendous hurt or tremendous grief in those relationships. Um, and it can be very healing to uh, reflect on our relationships with our parents and then reach out to them, even if we're incredibly angry or even if we feel that they are hopeless and will never change, uh, to do it without any expectation that they'll change. Just like we're not trying to change our children, they can only be who they are. There's a beautiful line from Yeats, by the way, that goes like this. What else could she have done being who she was? Was there another Troy for her to burn? We all wind up being uh, in some way limited by what the East calls our karma, you know? So, and you can see it very clearly in the earlier generation. You can look at your parents, at your father and your mother, and see exactly how they got to be who they are are and very often think these people are not going to change in this lifetime. They're going to be that way till they die. But you know, uh, I don't believe it. I think that to a degree, how we relate to people influences the quality of how people relate to us. So if we can bring awareness and compassion and sensitivity and wisdom to those relationships and not get caught up in our expectations of them or how they should be, or how angry we are about what happened in the past or what didn't happen in the past, but stand, take a stand in the present moment with open-heartedness, Sometimes relationships heal and melt away and feelings get expressed that might not have been expressed for 50 or 60 years. And your parents will still be exactly who they were, but a little more uh, discovered. I am having wonderful times with my 85-year-old mother, dancing with her. Uh, conversing with her, doing things uh, that ex uh, express my joy that she's still on the planet in ways that are so healing of our relationship, infinitely deeper and, and warmer than ever happened before when I was younger. And I'm also dealing with watching my father uh, lose his mind through Alzheimer's and to be able to sit with him for hours and just be with him and in a way hold his hand and hold him and use physical touch and emotional presence to just carry him through. So I think the world is changing and as men and women we need to change with it. My own view is that um, you know, along the lines of uh, Jungian uh, psychology, that the male contains the female and the female contains the male. And that's true embryologically in development of the fetus, and it's true, I think, psychologically, and it's true uh, mythologically. So <clears throat> part of the challenge is to, uh, for men is to understand hard and to understand soft and be able to embody hardness, uh, 
and strength of a certain kind when it's required and flexibility and balance and softness when that's required and weave those two together. When I see Marisa and the baby, the, the two of them together, it's, uh, sometimes I don't believe it. No? Like, uh, it's it's uh, pretty mysterious, yeah. isn't it, and amazing. Yeah. That new life has come from the two yeah. of you. As a man, do you find that you feel like you have to take responsibility for this? Maybe 600 years ago, the man was the guy who has to go out for hunting yes. and do it, all those things. No? So today it's a little bit different, but it's still very much the same idea, no? the whole thing. Yeah. And so that's a lot to carry on your shoulders, yeah. and still to not lose touch with those precious moments of, yeah. of family. Cause the work can take you so much out of the home that sometimes I feel, you know, that if I'm not careful, I can feel like a stranger when I come home because I've been so out in the world. It seems to me that it's really wonderful when families can find time and find the wherewithal and the energy to spend time together doing things together. And it seems like you folks uh, do that quite beautifully. And I wonder how that evolved in your family and, and what how it feels to you all for you know, mm. spending this kind of time together. Sometimes it's boring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can you say more about that? Well. When mommy does my practicing with me, I usually end up, well, most of the time it's good, but sometimes I break down and I just don't want to do practicing anymore because I just get so frustrated mm -hmm. when she comes along and tries to comfort me. I just get more frustrated than I already was. times we're so stressed and so time pressured. I've heard myself say to my young children from time to time when they were young, uh, out of my own exasperation, by the way, hurry up. I don't have any time for this. When she's got to try on three or four dresses before she decides what she's going to wear at the nursery school. Now, when I heard myself say something like that, I don't have any time for this. I stopped. I said to myself, geez, if I don't have time for this, what do I have time for? What is it that is driving me so bad that I don't have time for my four-year-old or three-year-old daughter to try on a bunch of dresses and to revel with her in the joy of like, well, pink or green or frills or this or that. I mean, these moments don't last. to not give myself the joy of dropping in on that one, but instead to teach her that I don't have any time and no one else has any time and hurry up, we gotta get in the car and gotta go in the carpool. It's setting up the whole day for a kind of a kind of push anxiety driven kind of feeling. I don't think any of us wanna do that to our children, but we ourselves are driven, we're anxious, we're time pressured. As far as the children are concerned, uh, they're under tremendous pressures today in yeah. terms of developing themselves, going to school, the challenges of school, 
picking a career, finding out, getting in touch with who they are, finding out what they want to do, right. the friends they want to be around. It's so easy to be self-absorbed uh, for all of us that we are, we're human beings. We got a lot on our minds. Very often we come home from a long day of work and we're exhausted and then we have to do the parenting. It's like, but if we stop and think for a moment, what are our priorities? Why have children? Who are these people? Uh, are, don't they merit some degree of our energy? Uh, and at least as much as we're devoting to our work in some way. Now, how you do that is a, a huge question because, you know, juggling work and family, even if you, you know, uh, have a lot of support, but if, if you are a single parent or you have, you know, children with special needs or anything like that, it's like unspeakably huge. But we need to ask ourselves, well, what are we doing? What is important here? And if what's important here ultimately is the quality of the relationship, then we have to attend to the quality of the relationship. I think one reason why we have perhaps more time than some families is we don't have a television. We've never had one. Ah. <laughs> so the, that, um, in some respects, that's, that's put a bit more responsibility on George and me because we can't stick the kids in front of the TV and say, you know, I have to make dinner. Right. Uh, or I have to make phone calls, or I have to So the TV whatever. isn't the babysitter. The, uh, no. Yeah. So that's taught the kids an enormous resilience because they've had to learn to explore other things and, and keep themselves mm -hmm. interested in life. Playing uh, with these puzzle pieces really is an opportunity to sit here and discuss with the children the events of the day. Mm -hmm. What's going on in your life? This doesn't mean anything <laughs> as such. Whether we complete this puzzle or we don't complete this puzzle, it really means nothing. It's the time that we have to spend together to discuss issues. There's a beautiful poem by Antonio Machado that I think speaks to this sort of dimension of grief and of possibility and how we can use it. And so uh, bringing mindfulness to the field of emotions, whether it's with our children or our parents, is tremendously valuable. And it goes like this. The wind, one brilliant day, called to my soul with an odor of jasmine. In exchange for the odor of my jasmine, I would like all the odor of your roses. I have no roses. All the flowers in my garden are dead. Well then, I'll take the withered petals and the yellowed leaves and the waters of the fountain. And the wind left, and I wept. And I said to myself, what have you done with the garden that was entrusted to you? This is a huge grief poem. It's like, what have you done with the garden that was entrusted to you? It's not a blaming poem. He's not saying, oh, you were bad, I was bad. He's saying, I neglected something. I neglected to cultivate something that was calling to my soul. Well, I like to frame it in the present, of course, because I teach mindfulness, so that we might turn it more into what, what is it that we're doing with the gardens that are entrusted to us? So while our children are with us, they are gardens that are entrusted to us. While our parents are with us, they are gardens that are entrusted to us. While we have a body, it's a garden that's entrusted to us. While we have work, it's a garden that we can cultivate. So there are all these various ways in which we can make use of what we are given to grow, to uh, heal, to transform ourselves into roses, into uh, something more than withered petals and yellowed leaves. But sooner or later, we'll all become withered petals and yellowed leaves. And there's something very poignant about that. I think when 
people hear a lot of talk about mindfulness, they can really be perplexed as to what the hell is this guy talking about? Uh, because it's so simple, it's it's hard in a way. You know, it's like it's simple, but it's not easy, because what it involves is capturing our moments, uh, being present for them. So let's take the example. Of course, it changes as children grow across the lifespan, uh, from infancy to toddlerhood to you know as it goes on. I mean, we're always dealing with different situations. Each child is also different because of different temperaments. But how you hold the present moment is something that you can work with all the time. So one example, uh, say waking up a child in the morning. And by the way, have no expectations about the, how the child is going to greet you. Sometimes you wake up a grumpy teenager and you might get your head bitten off, snarled at, uh, or worse. You know, profanity spewed about uh, as if like, you know, you're just the hired help or worse. How to take that without necessarily being self-righteous, getting, you know, on my high horse and stomping out of the room, uh, slamming the door, becoming more adolescent myself than the child in some way. Very prone to do that kind of thing. I think a lot of us are that we ex have expectations of our children. And then if they don't conform to our expectations, then... Mm, the proverbial stuff sometimes really hits the proverbial fan, often totally automatically without awareness. It's a beautiful thing to do, to walk into a child's room, maybe do it, if you're time anxious, do it a little earlier. Walk into a child's room and sit down on the child's bed or next to the bed and just gaze at the child. And ask yourself, it's to yourself, not in words, but in, revel in the mystery of this being. Reflect for a moment or two, who is this child? What does this child really need from me today? And then see if you can bring a sensitivity to how you touch the child to wake them, whether you're touching them with your voice or you're touching them with a gentle uh, you know, hand on the shoulder or something like that, to transition them from sleep and that kind of peacefulness into wakefulness and the demands of the day. So it's a big change in your lives from five months ago, Comfort, you know, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it is. Your whole it's life is case. different. The main thing for us is time, just time together. Like now we're trying to um, um, sort of capture, like if she does fall asleep, we try to spend some time together mm -hmm. as a couple. Mm -hmm. Like that really changed in the relationship. Right. We went from being Felipe and Marisa to being parents exactly primarily and then and when we maya have extra time yeah, yeah yeah maya becomes the priority everything in the relationship has to shift for that there's a huge gulf and it's part of the mystery i was talking about between any human being and any other human being even if your father and son or mother and daughter or or, or uh, for that matter husband and wife or or brother and sister there's a certain mystery to who we are ourselves. And one of the reasons to practice meditation and to develop uh, you know, silence and solitude and calmness of mind and reflection is to actually listen more deeply to who we really are. But it is something of a mystery. Then when you say, well, who are these children? We both know and we don't know. We know something about their temperaments, and the more we listen and the more we observe carefully, the more we will know. But there's also a way in which we don't know who they are, we don't know where they're going, and in a sense, we're simply their guardians for a period of time. often felt that I didn't want to be spending time with the girls just on activities that were developing their abilities. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, more. not taking them to gymnastics, not taking them to this so that, that I was either a chauffeur or essentially um, keeping them committed to activities. So that's something I've had to think long and hard about when I'm practicing with them.
because mm -hmm. the tradition that we practice with, the Suzuki method, involves the parents very, very much. I've practiced with both girls, and so um, I've had to spend the time doing that with them. But then, y you know, you have to think, well, is, is that my function as a parent? That's pretty good. Okay, now, are there any other passages you want to uh, attempt? No! <laughs> So I've tried to, to make sure that we spend time, downtime together, and nothing time together. Just yeah. being together. Being together and leaving them alone. Right. They need their own space, so they say their own time together, mm -hmm. or apart by themselves. So working mindfully with expectations is a huge one because we will have many expectations for our children. If they flip out in the supermarket, for instance, and we're entirely embarrassed because, you know, it's reflecting about how I am as a parent. I've seen many, many people on the checkout counter just sort of completely shame their children just because they were embarrassed. And they say, you're gonna get it when we get home or something like that, you know? And you can hear this stuff a lot. Uh, or stop whining or uh, behave yourself or uh, be a good boy or else or you'll get smacked or all of those kinds of things. And the way I see those is that they are arrows shot straight into the heart of the child saying, you're no good. That's the real message is, you are no good. Instead of, I don't like your behavior at this moment. It's like, there's something wrong with you. Those things hurt. And often you don't see the effect that it has on the child. 20 or 30 years later, a person says to you, I feel like I was just um, hurt for every time that I didn't conform to my parents' expectations. Well, when we start to reflect on, do we even conform to our own expectations? Sometimes we're harder on ourselves than anybody else on the planet, and we continually beat ourselves up. So this is a path that's hugely compassionate and also self-compassionate. And I think a lot of us in this society really need to work on the dimension of self-compassion because we, we put so many expectations on ourselves that we can actually never live up to them. Very often they're unconscious and we're actually straitjacketed and very strongly attached to things that don't serve our ultimate interest. We who are adults, we're once children. And uh, we followed our own path to how we got here. And along the way, uh, we were either seen or not seen in our family of origin. A lot of people report that they were actually not seen for who they were. There was a kind of an insistence that they be a certain way. And if they weren't that way, they paid for it. And some of the children learned that they couldn't afford to be themselves or show who they were really, who they really were either at home or at school. So they put on a mask of a certain kind and went around being a good boy or a good girl or a cooperative or whatever it was that was required. To, uh, but it didn't come out of their own heart. It came out of, in some way, a need to hide from the uh, consequences of, of actually showing who you actually were, the, the, the side that the parents didn't want to see, the exuberant side or the wild side or the, or the selfish side or whatever it was that got shamed or got, you know, uh, criticized sometimes mercilessly or sometimes, uh, you know, frankly, you know, uh, uh, abusively. Uh, and so many people wound up actually hiding or carrying out of childhood certain kinds of patterns, certain kinds of self-images, certain kinds of views that actually become constraining, almost like straitjackets, and very often wind up coloring our relationships. Many of these are completely unconscious. We don't know anything about them, but they actually color who we're attracted to, uh, how we speak to certain kinds of people, what our deep feelings are about ourselves and our own worth. So for me, it's really important that we stay together, that there's like a, a sense of, yeah. Uh, yeah, unity. 
And, and I think one of the biggest things is communication. Like every time I turn around and I see people splitting up, it's just a matter of them not really being able to talk and really listen to each other. So that's what I've grown up with between mm -hmm. my parents. Mm -hmm. So they seem to be saying the same things, but they're just not hearing each other. The trick is to not take the madness or the grief or the or the craziness of one generation and unwittingly pass it on to the next generation. That's where conscious parenting comes in, a certain kind of reflection about what is driving me, what are my motives for doing this. Uh, the extreme, of course, is where you're kind of running a military household and everybody has to salute you and say yes, sir, or whatever. Uh, the great, uh, what's it called? The, the great Santini, that would be the sort of, uh, one ridiculous extreme, but there are many, many ways in which we can easily fall into these uh, emotional straitjackets or be hijacked. And every time we get triggered in a certain kind of way, we get hard and we get shaming and we get sometimes humiliating or, or we get self-righteous and say, not in my house or that kind of thing. And you can hear these things come up in yourself and they never help because they're always somewhat disregarding of the totality of the other person, the child. It's phenomenal, the swings in teenage years. Mood swings? Yeah, from being, being very loving and close, and then pulling away from the parents, and then mm -hmm. back again. And as, as, as we go through those swings, um, different things happen each time. Right. But um, I try to keep my center in the swing. <laughs> Doesn't always work. Does it work? sometimes feel like uh, you're being rejected and it and it hurts, so you're being abandoned in some ways by by him? It's hard not to get caught up by the surface behavior. You know that teenage ability to be so. Uh, rude and yes, nasty, right. and, and, and Nina knows me by now, so she knows how to hit all my buttons. <laughs> mm -hmm. I like being around my friends a little bit more, mm -hmm. and I like to kind of get away from the family just to spend time with my friends because mm -hmm. we share more of the same interests mm -hmm. and the same needs, so that, that's that been one of the ways. And also, I don't know, it's it's different now because I don't know, I find practicing and a lot of other things, I don't know, a w more of a waste of time. Like, I feel like I could be doing a lot of better things that I like to do. Mm -hmm. When they grow into their fullness and their wholeness and look back at us and see us as we actually are, it would probably be wonderful if we ourselves could be whole, if we could be whole. The chances of us doing that are vastly improved if we are working at it all along. Otherwise, what often happens conventionally is you have your children and it sometimes feels like, oh, my life is on hold now until my children are out of the house, until they graduate from college, or I stop spending money for them, supporting them, or whatever. And there's a certain way in which people sense that they don't actually grow, that even as a couple in relationships you know, with two partners, that they're so busy doing the kids that they don't actually remember who each other is. And then when you have the empty nest syndrome, then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, who are you, you know? Uh, if you are bringing moment-to-moment -moment awareness to the family right along in this, no matter when your children come to you, then there's, uh, I think, a chance to continue on your own growth trajectory far beyond career. Far be this is really, in some way, we're talking about nurturing the soul. So mindful parenting would be nurturing the soul life of your children and your, the soul life of yourself and your relationship simultaneously. I remember my first day in kindergarten. And when, I, when the day was finished, I was all smiling and happy because I loved my day. And I always used to run up into my mom's arms and I used to run up and then jump into her arms and then we just hug and it was so nice. I just liked hugging with my mom. What we're talking about is really dropping into your own heart, dropping into your own soul, the fullness of your life, and acting out of that.
Sometimes that acting is not doing anything, simply being there, simply being present, a benign, loving presence. It's not necessarily built into our nature with moving so fast to remember to do that. So it's all in the remembering. We all know how to pay attention. We all know how to be heartful. We all know how to be mindful, but we never remember. So all those moments go by the boards and we say, whoops, blew it again. But the practice is to try to see it coming, not blow it in this moment. Or if you do, great, I blew it again. Blown it a million times already in this life. Uh, but see if you can uh, loop yourself back more quickly and apologize and say, hey, I just blew it. I'm sorry. I'm agitated about something else. Or I really do need to talk to you about this kind of thing because it brings up all sorts of stuff for me. Let's figure out a time to do it. Now, of course, you don't say that to a four-year-old, but you might say that to a 16-year-old or an 18-year-old and realize when the fruitful times are for connecting and when they're not. Children feel that as tremendous respect, regard. It's regard for their sovereignty, and they honor it tremendously in you. Things which get, there are things which get you.